I think it's sort of a welcome to Antarctica type day. The Walking with the Wounded South Pole Ally Challenge is a race like no other. Led by expedition patron Prince Harry. If you screw up out here, you get punished. Four wounded British soldiers. We're going to stop faffing and just get on with it. Are taking on teams from the Commonwealth and the USA. Right now, I feel like I'm at war. In a race to the South Pole, they'll face extreme temperatures. This is a savage environment. It's hardcore. Over 200 kilometers of grueling terrain. <laughs> in the world's most hostile environment, Antarctica. If we go on like this, we are simply not gonna do it. It's a story of survival and of overcoming the scars of war, inside and out. Look what happens when so many people come together. You can achieve pretty much anything. It's the morning of the race start in Antarctica. Sunday morning, the first, I think. Um, and we're leaving at 1300. The wind's blowing, I think, probably 30 miles an hour, bringing it to minus 40, potentially, I don't know. But it's damn cold. Three teams of wounded soldiers, brothers in arms on the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan, are gearing up against the Antarctic cold and each other. Obviously, you know, everyone's very keen to win. All are determined to be first to the pole. The British are missing one arm and four legs between them. This is their greatest challenge since being wounded. We'll all have good and bad days. It's just how it goes. You can't be on top of it every single time. Guy Disney lost his right leg in an ambush in Afghanistan. Once we get going, we can find our, no pun intended, but we'll find our feet along the way, if you know what I mean. Duncan Slater lost both his legs after he was blown up by an IED. Just want to get on with it, really. Uh, excited that in 14 days' time, we'll get the South Pole, yeah. Ibi Ali's right arm was severed by a roadside bomb in Iraq. Tell me that rucksack I put on the end. Let's hold it down. Major Kate Philp lost her left leg in Afghanistan, making her the first British female combat amputee. Oh, lovely. Brilliant. Duncan, Guy, Ibi, Kate and Prince Harry will each be hauling over 80 kilos of food and kit behind them. They'll be racing nine hours a day in minus 40 degrees and below. All three teams head to the start line. Time for final checks. Almost ready. Just donning the music. Uh, what am I going to listen to? Bit of that. Shuffle. Volume. Pause. Ready to go. One, two, three. They're off. The race is on. Just eight months earlier, Prince Harry officially launched the South Pole race, throwing down the gauntlet to the other teams. To Soldier On Canada, Soldiers of Summits from the US, and Soldier On Australia, welcome to the party. As a member of the British team, I will have a brew ready for you when you join us at the pole. It's a race, let's be honest. It's a massive race. It's not just about fitness, it's about knowing exactly what you can and can't do. I'm terrified for myself, to be honest. Uh, hugely daunted. So I can't even begin to imagine what it's going to be like for them. And you know, to take a double amputee to the pole, it's going to be really quite a moving moment when we get there. For me, it's bigger than just these guys. We are trying to raise money, but also raise awareness for the fact that the injuries that they've sustained, they're going to carry those for the rest of their lives. Two months later, and Team UK is in Iceland to train for the race. Hour upon hour of skiing, pulling heavy loads is the order of the day. 
the four are training under the watchful eye of polar guide Conrad Dickinson. The afternoon was an awful lot slower because of the conditions. He's responsible for getting them race ready. People are learning how to cope with their injuries and the limbs in a skiing capacity. The bottom line is they're going to hurt. You cannot get to the South Pole without suffering quite a degree of pain. He's getting them into the polar routine. Two hours skiing, followed by a 10-minute stop to refuel. For 34-year-old double amputee Duncan Slater, the short breaks are barely enough time to tend to his stumps. You get a lot of sweat, and then your liner starts moving about <laughs> like a sort of uh, like a wet welly boot, really. Duncan joined the RAF regiment as a teenager in 1998. Since then, he's done four tours of Iraq and four of Afghanistan. I absolutely loved it. I loved every part of it. Um, I liked the physical nature of the job. For me, going on operations was definitely the pinnacle of my career. In 2008, Duncan married Kim. You can't help but think, like, are they going to come back? Are they going to come back whole? And it's, that sounds horrible, doesn't it? Are they going to be the same when they come back? Yeah, you, you try and think positively, but it is really hard. Kim's fears became all too real when Duncan's vehicle was blown up in Afghanistan on the 31st of July, 2009. I never heard the bang, but I guess it was the biggest bang that you don't hear kind of thing. And I just remember being flipped about like a little toy, like a little rag doll. I was blown out of the vehicle about 30 foot into a compound. I was isolated, I was on my own. I was struggling to breathe because I'd broken all my ribs on my left-hand side. You know, it sounds dramatic, but I thought I was dying. I couldn't move, my back was in so much pain. I looked down and my legs are all at right angles, all bent and twisted, and my left arm couldn't really sort of move it at all. No, I'll be honest, I was totally scared. I didn't, didn't know what the hell was going on. I think it's just one of the most sort of helpless feelings that I've ever had in my life. Duncan was Kazivak back to the UK. When I found out he was injured, I was at work actually. My phone went and I picked it up and I just heard this, it's me, it's Duncan, and, and my heart just sank. And it's all a bit of a blur really, I can't really remember, sorry. I was placed in intensive care, my wife came up to the hospital um, and uh, <clears throat> Nothing can ever prepare you for that because you don't expect to come to the next time that you're going to see your husband that he's going to be like that. Five months after Duncan was blown up, Lily was born. I don't think she realises how much she gave me. She was a reason that I wanted to get out of my wheelchair and get walking. Duncan's legs were so badly damaged that 12 months after his injury, he chose to have them amputated. I remember coming round once I'd had them off, and one thing they try and get you to do is like sort of sit up and have a look. I remember just feeling so glad that they were gone. I'd grown to hate, hate my legs. You didn't even notice that he didn't have any legs anymore. It just looked like the old Duncan, and he was laughing again and cheery. Yes. From then on, I, I just decided not to look back. It just changed me a little bit, that's all. And now, um, you know, I've got to put my legs on in the morning, but hey, that's, that's fine, I'm still here. From point of view, just proving that someone can do it on a good pair of prosthetics is, is a big deal, you know? You know, it'll be great for my family to see it and my little one, when she grows up, to see that dad did just sit about when he got injured. He actually went and did something and, you know, it wasn't the easiest thing to do, but he did it anyway. The team press on even when the Icelandic weather turns. In Antarctica, it will be colder windier and much, much harder. 
bed tonight is under canvas in a snowstorm. Later that evening, Prince Harry arrives to join the team. Hey. He's missed a vital couple of days and needs to catch up with training if he's to make it to the South Pole. Glad to be here. What do you think? <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to seeing the boys, actually. The predictions with the weather definitely wasn't supposed to be this, that's for sure. No, it's different. Train hard, fight easy. That's how it always is. Three years ago, Harry spent three days in the Arctic. This time, in Antarctica, he'll be four weeks on the ice. If you're organized, you can live like a king. Hey, that was a pun. Live like a king. It's going to be a long <laughs> three days. If that's, if that's the extent of <laughs> your jokes, Conrad, I am again. really worried. As well as jokes, Conrad has a serious agenda for Harry. You know, I mean, cards on the table, mm. uh, with the utmost respect to you, I mean, I'm expecting a lot from you. Mm -hmm. You've got all your limbs, yeah, you know, yeah. you're fit. Some of the guys, you know, struggle yeah. with the, the leverage on the legs, so you're an integral part of the team. A good night's sleep has kept spirits high. What I suggest you do... <laughs> you what I suggest you do? Hey, hey. Yeah, we're gonna have a serious talk. I said, though. I said, where are you from? Yorkshire. And he goes, hell no. <laughs> I'm from Northumberland. So, so, so really, Harry's in a bit of bit of trouble here. That a, he thinks I come from the wrong county, and b, can't understand what I what I say. So we're gonna have a serious falling out, I think. Our, team, our team's gonna have one extra. It's gonna be a, tra a translator for, <laughs> for everyone else, so they can understand what the hell you're yeah, you talking about. It. You might be able to teach you some, <laughs> some good northern etiquette. The weather's closed in, and they are tent-bound for the day. Hello. 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 Of course, there's Hello. leg admin, is it? <laughs> so has it been easy for you injuries-wise or not? I've just picked up a rub over the last couple of days, which looks like nothing, but it's really debilitating. Kate Philp's stump is so sore, it could bring her Icelandic training to an early end. This is pretty hard, so you've got that, you know, digging into your skin, um, which isn't great. Kate joined the army in 2002 and is still serving with the Royal Artillery. I've always preferred sort of being outside, playing with my brothers and making dens rather than sort of inside with dolls. Kate was commanding an armoured vehicle in Afghanistan in 2008 when it clipped a roadside bomb. And then there was sort of smoke and the smell of chemicals coming up from the back. The situation was serious. Sadly, the colour sergeant was killed and the other two Gurkha soldiers were both badly injured. I then realised that something was wrong with my leg. I felt down the shin and I could feel that there were broken bones. I can remember sitting on the top of my vehicle, working out in my head how long it would take to fix and would I make it out for the end of the tour. Kate's left leg was shattered by the explosion. Back in the UK, the outlook wasn't good. My consultant described my heel and ankle as a jigsaw of fractures and said that I um, might not even walk properly again and would almost certainly be in pain on a daily basis. They could try fusing the ankle, and that didn't sound like a great option. I asked them what the alternative was, and they explained that it would be to have the leg amputated below the knee. I just asked, OK, with a prosthetic, will I be able to run, play tennis and ski? And my consultant said yes, and I said, well, then that's fine. I absolutely had to have the leg amputated, because otherwise I just wouldn't have a, have a life. I think when you make the decision to, of that sort of enormity of, you know, to have a limb amputated, yes, it hits home at times that this is for life. You know, because you, you don't look the same anymore, you don't feel the same. I've been through sort of periods of, of emotion where it's frustrated me or I've got fed up or, you know, things like putting on weight. It sounds a really vain thing. But 
I basically lost a little bit of my left leg as opposed to guys who have lost both legs, who have lost arms, triple amputees, people with brain injuries. The fallout from Kate's battlefield injury hit her parents hard. I think Dad found it more difficult because I'm his only daughter and I'm the youngest, so, you know, as much as I would fight against it, I'm his little girl. In Iceland, as the team prepare for another day on the ice, Kate's not with them. I think you made the right decision, to be honest. I think I have. It's pretty gutting seeing the team move off without you. Conrad's worried that no one will make it at all. We'd be incredibly lucky to win this race. None of them are fit enough yet. The UK team are in Iceland, training for the South Pole Challenge that lies ahead. I've been smiled on here like a... Uh, can't wait to get going. Wake up this morning to no wind and just sun beaming through was beautiful. How we did the cooking? <laughs> Had our breakfast on the veranda. Yeah, oh, yeah. worked out well. Very nice. Today's a dream ticket. This is why we do what we do. Yeah. The team need to ski at least 30 kilometres today to see if they're anywhere near race ready. But not all of them are up to it. It's a shame. I think Kate. I don't know if Kate's skiing today. She decided not to because of the sore in her leg. It is a bit of a worry. Of the competing teams, only the British are missing limbs. With just four legs between them, they need to train hard. But Kate's stump is too painful for her to ski today. I think you made the right decision, to be perfectly honest. I think I have. Because I don't, I don't it's, it's, it's annoying. It's a beautiful day. Oh, it's just... It's annoying, but um, it's better that it heals quickly than have you out of the equation for five weeks well, that, yeah, and bumming up your training. Yeah, hey, don't worry. Right, come on, guys. As the team set off, Kate's left behind. It's pretty gutting seeing the team move off without you. I've got a blister on my knee, which I know from prior experience can take about three weeks to heal. It's better to have a day off than put myself out for three, four weeks. So. Rubs and blisters are a real concern for Team UK and could seriously affect their chances in the race. We're fully aware that pace for pace, we're not going to be able to outmatch the Aussie and the Canadian team. Guy Disney's the only wounded Brit with Arctic experience. Three years ago, he skied to the North Pole. He knows the South will be just as hard. We're going to be uncomfortable when we go down there, and it's all about getting into the psychology, knowing this is going to hurt. Which sounds pretty um, unsympathetic, but ridiculously unforgiving environment and you can't go into it undercooked. At the end of the day, if it happens in the actual challenge, then I'll just grizz on and go through it. The team fall into the polar routine. Two hours on, ten minutes off, for nine hours a day. We are very much thinking about the race stuff, about how we can shave off time. We're doing a lot of discussions about that, because it is very much at the forefront of our minds. Captain Guy Disney joined the Light Dragoons in 2008. A year later, he was in Afghanistan at the wrong end of an enemy attack. He felt utterly, utterly immortal until this, you know, sucker punch comes out of nowhere. A rocket propelled grenade got fired at my vehicle. It releases a jet of molten metal, and so that came through the side of the vehicle, straight through my leg. and killed one of my soldiers in the back of the vehicle. A moment that lives with you till the day you die. I deeply swapped positions in a heartbeat if I could. You know, far rather it's me than him, definitely. I looked down, I remember just smelling an incredibly acrid smoke. I mean, the, the smell of burning flesh is something that will never, ever leave me. It's effectively a sort of smell of death. I remember when it happened, looking down and seeing what was left of my leg, it was just sinew hanging on to a sort of charred and burnt foot. I remember thinking, I don't want to die here, I want to live out my years, hopefully back in the green fields of England. 
at Camp Bastion, Guy's leg was amputated. He was airlifted back to Selly Oak Hospital in the UK. You go into Selly Oak and there are beds filled with double amputees, treble amputees, news of lads being killed, I think it's pretty sobering. After three operations and many months of rehabilitation, Guy served a second tour of Afghanistan. I don't feel any different walking down the high street. Not overly keen on wearing a pair of shorts on the beach, not because I'm that fussed about people staring. Well, it bothers me a bit, but... <sighs> it probably does bother me, actually. It probably annoys the shit out of me. Watching someone like Duncan ski with no legs. I thought there's no way a double amputee will do this. You're seeing his attitude on skis, he'll get there. He's a tough, tough guy. For all the teams, this challenge is about inspiring others, raising awareness and funds to help the wounded back into work. If that encourages one person to just do something that they weren't thinking of doing that day that they thought was beyond them, then it's brilliant. It's mission achieved. The stop is a chance to rest, attend to war wounds, and refuel. Just put on an extra merino wool layer, although it's quite mild at the moment, it can be quite susceptible to a cold. Captain Ibra Ibi Ali lost his right arm while serving with the Yorkshire Regiment on his first tour of Iraq in 2007. We were on a vehicle patrol outside Basra when we were hit by three roadside bombs. There was a huge explosion, a huge fireball, actually. And I looked down at my uh, hands because I couldn't feel either of them. My right hand was sort of holding on by a gristle and bone. So, yeah, I think I was reasonably badly injured. Uh, one of the soldiers in the back of my vehicle lost a leg, young uh, Private Herbert, and the other soldier, Private Davey, was quite badly injured by fragmentation as well in the back of the vehicle. The most haunting thing is that, uh, unfortunately, our Private Simpson was killed uh, at the scene. Despite the tragic circumstances and his own serious injuries, Ibi remained in command on that fateful day. People say that you can feel your life force ebbing away, and slowly I, I think I could actually feel that. As Ibi fought for his life, one of his soldiers spotted someone filming nearby. That's my vehicle there and the, the poor driver that unfortunately didn't make it, Private Simpson. It's quite difficult to watch, actually. It's quite sad when you realise the circumstances that are taking place. You just think this is, this is a local person that's recording, recording death. It took two hours for backup to arrive. It was only then that Ibi was prepared to relinquish command and be Kazivak'd himself. That's me being walked to the, uh, to the helicopter. I just remember thinking there was no way I was going to go on a stretcher or anything like that, and I just thought, two fingers to the insurgents. At a field hospital in Basra, what remained of his right arm was amputated. I went to scratch my nose with my right hand, and it hit my stump. I suddenly realised, actually, I don't have a right hand. For his act of exemplary gallantry despite his own grave injuries, Ibi was awarded the Military Cross for his conduct that day. It's one of Britain's highest battlefield honours. The guys, they were phenomenal. I can hand on heart say that they ensured that I stayed alive, and the two of the guys injured seriously with me were kept alive by, by the rest of the team, uh, and I'll be forever grateful. Ibi and the team ski on. Down south, when they're racing, they'll have to do this day in, day out, all the way to the pole. Today's been a tough day. It's 
just getting all of us now in the mindset that that's the sort of day that we can expect in the South Pole. By late afternoon, they've clocked up an impressive 33 kilometers, but they're exhausted and Conrad's worried how they'll cope when they do it for real. The team's been really good today, but none of them are fit enough yet to spend 11, 12 hours on the feet. It was a bit disappointing uh, with Kate this morning. I don't want to see her Kazavakt early on in the race. Really, really rubbish watching the guys ski off this morning. But I know that with another sort of four months training in my belt, that I'll be in a much, much better position to take on the race. I think we share, share the feeling. We're a bit fragged. Yeah. There's no way to replicate scheme for hours on end. I think it's good to get a bit of sort of psychological strength there by you knock out eight, ten hours a day and you sort of think, well, I can do that now. Bearing in mind it's a race and with injuries, my worries are that we push ourselves as a group too hard too quickly. We would never forgive ourselves if someone dropped out. I'd say the big thing is the fear of failure. You know, we want everyone to get there and we genuinely feel that. But we want to be the first ones to get there. Conrad's not so sure. We'd be incredibly lucky to win this race. We're the underdogs, but we have got the team spirit. We have got the most injuries, there's no question about that. We're missing four legs and an arm and some other bits and pieces. Iceland has been a challenge, and now Team UK is heading for more trouble in a giant deep freeze. The experience that in real life out in the open, that would be terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And Harry ties himself in knots. Out the hole, around the tree, and then back down the hole. Here's how I think it is. I don't know. <laughs> the walking with the wounded UK South Pole race team have come to a giant deep freeze in the East Midlands, normally used to test supercars and military vehicles. The guys are here to experience firsthand the extremes that Antarctica can throw at them. In the deep freeze, the temperature's been set to minus 35, more than 30 degrees colder than Iceland. <laughs> I wish I was busy today. Yeah, something, something else had popped up. The deep freeze will push prosthetic limbs, polar kit, and human bodies to the limit. Do the rat to catch you. <laughs> <laughs> right on the end, so I would, I would suggest... Here, as in Antarctica, expedition medic Dr. Dan Royce de Saar is trying to make sure they're not injured in the bitter cold. This is, this is a very um, dangerous environment that these people are going into. Before they enter the deep freeze, Dan issues biometric sensors to monitor their temperatures. For Harry, he's tracking core temperature. Are you giving me a pill? To check for hypothermia. The team are ready to enter the freezer. They're stepping from a warm summer's day into minus 35. Your nostrils start to freeze up. All the hairs within your nose um, freeze together. Um, it's that just that stark, stark coldness, which you like take a big breath in and you feel it instantly. I feel like I'm a frozen chicken in a giant freezer. Do you know what I mean? It is. It's a giant freezer. There's no sun. There's nothing to look at. It's not pretty. We're the first people to spend a night in here. Wait, come on in. Under Conrad's leadership. Harry, Guy, Kate, Duncan, and Ibby will spend 16 hours in here, living out an Antarctic day of racing, storms, and camping out. That's a real dry cold, like, uh, I'd rather get used to it now than get down there and be shot, so I don't get cold feet, so. I haven't seen some of the guys' faces. It seems their eyelashes have all frozen, and uh, I imagine mine have as well. After nearly two hours of exercise, Guy is feeling the effects of the deep chill. One thing that you do notice in the extreme climate is whether it's either really hot or really cold, is you get phantom limb pain. 
Exercise. He gets almost like little electric shock. Sometimes big ones, sometimes uh, small ones, and they just kick off. And it's just the mind sort of feeling for the toes that aren't there anymore. In Antarctica, a storm can hit at any time. In the control room, the wind is turned up and the temperature down to minus 45. The only way to keep warm is to keep moving. But for Ibby, that's not enough. That was cold, seriously cold. You can just see where all the ice and everything started gathering up on that side. So, um, yeah, it's a hell of a lesson. He has to warm up what's left of his arm. The sub temperature's down to eight degrees. We need to get taken out and put another layer on it. OK. Yeah. Oh, blimey, I mean, that's cold. That's very cold. Stay here and you warm up before you get back in. Okay. That sort of temperature, you could get damaged very quickly. Their amputated limbs are much more prone to cold injury because of their reduced circulation and muscle mass. Losing more of a stump is not an option. We're in a safe place here. This is not Antarctica, so we've got a safety door. We can come out and warm the skin up. It's a great lesson. When we hit the south, I'll just prep first thing in the morning using heat pads and the layering system. As Ibby rejoins the team, it's Duncan's turn to be taken out. It's just, it's, it's very blue and dusky and obviously cold. They've never been this cold. Duncan's metal prosthetic legs are sucking the warmth out of his stumps and putting him at risk. We're gonna have, we, we, we need you to have more layers on than this. Definitely. If it's cold like that for a very long, long length of time, you're going to get an injury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, very, yeah. very quickly. Yeah. It's very tough in a team scenario to admit a slight fragility. It's difficult to admit, isn't it, when, you know... It, it is, because there's a certain pressure. You don't want to be the first one to... to break, and you never want the, uh, you know... Call it the, getting on the jack wagon, like you know, you don't want to be the first one to get on the vehicle to say I've had enough. You don't want that. Imagine if stayed in for another, another half an hour, get yourself a cold weather injury, and well, that's not going to fix it any time soon. And before you know it, you know you've got to be replaced on the expedition. It's just, just uh, not going to happen. With the team warmed up and back in the chamber, an Antarctic storm is brewing. There is no respite. In the control room, the wind is cranked up to 75 kilometers per hour. The temperature lowered to minus 58. They're very likely to face conditions like this down south. Exposed skin freezes in seconds. The risks are all too real. In the Antarctic, there is no escape. In this giant freezer, they can turn it off. If it gets too much. I wanted to take it up more to 80, but the floorboards were going to rip up <laughs> if we took it any further. Oh, it's really awesome, actually. I really enjoyed it. Everyone's sort of loving the wind now, but if that happened, we'd yeah. be like... No. <laughs> <laughs> to experience that in real life out in the open, that would be terrifying, absolutely terrifying. The team settled down for a long, cold night. It's minus 35. Stages of being unbelievably cold, whether it be your hand, face, nose, wherever. That was good. To be able to feel this temperature, especially for the, well, for the guys with no limbs, well, with some limbs, <laughs> it's, um, it's so much, it's, it's great for them, because now they know. 16 hours in the deep freeze has been a sobering experience. With only a few weeks left until departure, 
all three teams have gathered in an army base in Norfolk for their final kickback. <laughs> Harry has met the US team before. So we need a really long one. Ivan Castro was blinded in a mortar attack in Iraq in 2006. You've been pretty busy since we last saw each other. And, really, uh, yeah, yeah. Really, really busy. And how does it feel to be uh, an uncle? Um, oh, wow. very, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. He's starting to do a little bit more than just lie there and sleep and, sure. and do other things. So he's he's he starting has... to smile. It's Harry's first sight of the Commonwealth team. Two Canadians and two Australians. At first glance, they seem to have an advantage. Right, so come on then. What's, where, where are all the men missing limbs and stuff? <laughs> the hell? It doesn't take long for friendly rivalries to surface. You're going to have a brew waiting for us, mate? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have a couple of beers. All right, I'll see you guys in a bit. All right, yeah. Everyone has to pack all they'll need for 28 days on the ice. With departure looming, the pressure is mounting. I'm a little bit anxious, nervous, all those kind of things. But what so about? Why? Well, just because it's, it's, yeah, it's a big deal, isn't it? It's, I don't want to... I don't want, let the, don't want to let the side down through fitness or injuries or anything like that. Um, so it's just, yeah, there's, there's a, lot, there's a little, lot of pressure on everybody involved. Um, so you've just got to get it right. Each team member will need to take on six and a half thousand calories a day to keep them going during the race. There's a, uh, isn't it the rabbit, rabbit round? No, don't ask me, because I'm really not good. But isn't it, isn't it, doesn't I'm the sure rabbit, it is. the, the rabbit comes out of the ground around the tree back in the hall? That's where everyone knows that. That's how the rabbit I don't know why I'm being asked this, because it's not fair. I'm not good at it. All right, so out the hole, around the tree, and then back down the hole. Here's how I think it is. I don't know. No, we took them out. We took the, uh... That looks good. I think it's going to change the one I've got. The next time they see this kit will be at the race start line in Antarctica. Before they depart, there's a royal appointment. She had a temper in the room. Her face is on money. That's huge. <laughs> and emotional goodbyes as they set off for the Antarctic. With just days left until the walking with the wounded South Pole race team depart for Antarctica, there's a whirlwind of activity. Starting with a press call in Trafalgar Square, Former U.S. service members are on a race to the South Pole. I'm Alfonso Van Marsh in London. I'll tell you more coming up. The next day, the teams head off to Buckingham Palace. For U.S. team members Margot and Therese, it's a big deal. I was excited the first time I was able to just see Buckingham Palace. Now I'm going to go inside Buckingham Palace. I'm going to meet the Queen of England. I don't think excited explains it. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, her face is on money. That's huge. <laughs> That's amazing. Harry's arranged a private visit to meet his grandparents, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip. This is Inga Solheim, who took myself and Prince Harry to the North Pole oh, last did you? time round. Oh, did you? That was brave. She had a tent with him, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's incredibly brave. <laughs> <laughs> On my part. I survived. This is all the kit that we're using, so I'm sure you've seen it before. It's a special honour and a chance to share their stories with the Commander-in-Chief of the UK's armed forces. Kate lost her leg in 2008. Have you all been practicing in fridges? 
Prince Harry went to the That's Olympics. right. A guy was with Prince Harry and myself when we went to the, you, the you North Pole. I did, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mind the crevasses and things. <laughs> My mind. Yeah, yeah, so well, I hope this is it anywhere. works out all right here now. OK, everybody. I'm just waiting for the background. All right, stand by. And there we go. And thank you. <laughs> The South Pole race teams are at Heathrow Airport, about to leave for Antarctica. There's a mix of excitement and nerves. How you doing? Honestly, shitting myself today. <laughs> it's also a moment for goodbyes. It's going to be horrible, mate, yeah, really horrible. Um, I've been really lucky since I've been injured because I've had so much time with a little one. Um, and now, unfortunately, uh, this is the first time I've spent any time apart, so... You're not going to get upset, are you? you know, it's not a six-month tour in Hellman, so, you know, at the end of the day, what have I got to whinge about? Not, not a thing, so it's, it's all good. Right, ma'am. Take it easy. Stay safe. I'll see you when you get back. I'll look at you. I'll see you when you get back, right? En route to Antarctica, there's a stopover in South Africa. For Duncan, it's a chance to reflect on the very personal challenge that lies ahead. I think when, when we get down there, everyone's going to have a very individual experience, but an individual battle as well. I know that I'm going to have some bad days. I, I know, you know, and, and I've kind of left a lot of things for thinking about down there, if that makes sense. I think the hardest things that I've thought about is I let people down uh, the day I got blown up. I let my unit down, family, friends, and all, all the rest of it. I didn't feel like I was adding value to my wife's life, my child. I didn't think I was being a particularly good dad. One night, I had a, a, a really, really terrible turn. Um, and I thought, right, I don't like the way I am anymore. So I took myself away to a quiet spot and I just sat in a field at about two hours. And it's not a very nice feeling to hit rock bottom and say, right, I'm going to finish myself off. It's not the nicest thing to hear, but I'm not the only person that's done that. From then on, I sort of said, enough's enough, and kind of tried to inch by inch dig yourself out, like, uh, get, get on with it. So when I got picked for the South Pole, in my head, and I said, you know what, this is it. This is the new start for me. This is the, the sort of beginning that I need to, to sort of find out if there's the old me in there, you know. I'm me again. I can do something extraordinary. Antarctica is a six-hour flight away on a Russian cargo plane across the Southern Ocean. The teams arrive on the bleak Antarctic plateau. It's the world's largest ice sheet, 3,000 meters above sea level. It's minus 40. So you can feel it straight away, the nostril hair freezing. One thing I noticed as soon as you got off is the altitude. You're immediately short of breath. Um, and apart from that, the view is absolutely spectacular, but clearly not meant for mankind. Just look how cool it is. It's amazing. It's ridiculous. That a place like this should exist. One of the few places on Earth that hasn't been screwed up by humans. It's just nice being out here, not having sort of... You know, to have time to think about stuff without being hassled. If you can't be free here, where can you be free? At the bottom of the world, the race is about to begin. For the wounded, years of rehabilitation and months of training have led to this point. One, two, three. 
they're off. Ahead lies unforgiving ice and brutal cold. For soldiers already wounded in war, this will be a journey that tests them in mind and body. Next time, battered bodies risk further damage in the extreme cold. Damage to the cartilage of the ear and... and, and is it just cosmetic or would it affect hearing No, 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 it won't affect hearing. It won't, won't affect hearing. It will give you like a cauliflower ear. Can you feel this? 200 kilometers, 12 wounded soldiers and one prince heading for the pole.